Yeah. Fair question. I'd like to call the October 15th board meeting to order. This is the time and the place for the October 15th regular school board meeting. Welcome to all of you who are with us. It's nice to see people in the audience. <coughs> Let me um, introduce the individuals at the board table with me. From my right, we have Ross Harris and Janelle Carter. From the left, we have Karina Hernandez, Sean Heitman, Ben Fletcher, and at the table, at this table, <laughs> <laughs> with me are Paulette Newbold to my right. She is the board secretary, and to my left is Dr. Theron Schutte, the school superintendent, and I'm B. Niblock. We have a pink sheet on the speaker's table for you to sign up on if you are wishing to speak to an agenda item or to speak during public comments time and you're not already on the agenda. You'll be given five minutes to speak during public comments and according to board policy, we cannot respond to your comments, but we thank you for them anyway. Please read with me the mission statement for the Marshalltown School District. We develop learners who have the knowledge, skills, and positive mindset to successfully pursue a meaningful future through personalized learning experiences. And stand as you're able and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Are there any additions or corrections to the agenda? And since the posting of the agenda, we had some attachments um, that were added. Um, one of it, which is the proclamation for this evening. Um, some pictures of Mr. White on it. Uh, we've got a commendation uh, for Food Service Director Lynn Large. We have a uh, letter from Iowa State University Extension, a monthly financial report attachment, no? Um, and an update to the original um, Marshtown Learning Academy presentation. May I have a motion to accept the agenda as amended? So moved. Second. Harris Carter, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same. The motion carries 6 0. Mr. Potter. Speaking of Mr. Widener, we are we're honored that uh, we have him here, and Jackie's going to speak about the award that he received from the Iowa Council of Teachers of English. <coughs> It was my pleasure to write a letter on behalf of Brad Weirenauer to the Iowa Council of Teachers of English, as Brad has been very involved in multiple leadership positions at the high school and in the district. Not only as an instructional coach in the building, but as an MEA representative. He's been on our BLT, our instructional um, practices inventory team, our PDIS team. At the district level, he's been involved in, in uh, competency-based education, He's provided professional, professional development to our staff on the ELP standards, um, lots of things actually, AIW, um, PSYOP, that Shelter and Structures Observation Protocol. Uh, Brad, Brad has been an integral part of our learning community for our teachers. And when he was in the classroom every year, he had an opportunity to impact about 150 so students a year. But as a leader, a teacher leader on a, under our teacher, um, our TLC grant, he is impacting 1,400 students every single day in the work that he does with our students and making a difference um, and creating a positive learning environment in every single one of our classrooms. So it was really easy to write about Brad and to recommend him uh, as a member of ICTE to be to receive this award. Congratulations, Brad. Thank you. Required to do so. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, you know I'm an English teacher, so I like to talk. 
Um, and and you, you probably know that. But um, I really am thankful. I'm thankful to my uh, um, principal. Um, you know, I started my career in this district. This is my 25th year. So I um, learned how to teach in this district. I've grown as a teacher in this district. I've learned how to be a, a um, teacher leader in this district, and I've grown in that position as well. And so, you know, I'm very thankful to, to past and present colleagues, as well as administrators, as well as central office staff who have um, helped me through that journey. Um, that's the first reason, you know, that I'm, that I'm thankful, I guess. And, and the second um, thing I, I really have to say to you is this, that, that um, you know, 25 years um, in, you don't magically kind of wake up and find yourself with a treasure chest. A treasure <laughs> it's contagious. <laughs> it's a treasure, treasure chest of um, abilities and skills and knowledge. Those are um, coins that you pick up along the way, right? Um, so uh, um, a coin of, of making relationships and building relationships with students from day one to day 180. Um, a coin of, of um, uh, collegial conversation with folks, a coin of uh, uh, professional learning and professional development, the hard-earned currency of, of uh, an advanced degree, um, as well as the coin of, of putting that into place in, in the classroom. And so, you know, that, that sort of story, that sort of narrative of a teaching career, I think, um, maybe stands counter to a, a, a popular um, narrative promulgated by politicians in Des Moines of, of uh, um, you know, wage cessation and contractual negation and IPERS decimation in the name of better education. Um, and, and that puts boards like you, as well as administrators, I think here and across the state, at, um, at, a, at a bit of a, in a bit of a predicament because you know, you're, you're um, trying to attract and, and retain and grow the best teachers you possibly can so that, that um, all learners can learn and grow. Um, and so, you know, I, I just thank you that, that um, you, you give me this recognition of Award One um, as a way of kind of uh, um, countering those, those narratives that play out there. And, and um, I hope that uh, other, other um, individuals such as myself come before you in the years, you know, this year and, and years following um, um, to, to receive such recognition as well. One final note. I'd be remiss if you flip that little thing, that program over, you see one other person who has taught at MHS. In the year 2000, my colleague and, and mentor, Jan Mitchell, received this award as well. And so um, it's nice to know that I'm following in her footsteps. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. This month is National Principals Month, so we've invited our principals here to uh, be recognized. Please come forward. I think it could only be better if it was Deb standing here, yeah, because yeah. she's just a hair shorter. <laughs> I'm, I'm more than willing to move around. <laughs> if it makes you better, I'm, ha I'm happy to, to accommodate. Um, in the name and by the authority of the State of Iowa Proclamation, whereas principals are educational visionaries, ins instructional and assessment leaders, disciplinarians, community builders, budget and analysts, facilities managers, and administrators of legal and contractual obligations, and whereas principals work collaboratively with teachers and parents to develop and implement a clear mission, high curriculum standards, and performance goals, and whereas principals create school environments that facilitate great teaching and learning and continuous school improvement, and whereas the vision and action and ed dedication of principals provide the mobilizing force behind any school reform effort. And whereas the celebration of Principals Month honors elementary, middle, and high school principals and recognizes the importance of principals in ensuring that every child has access to a high quality education. Now, therefore, Kim Reynolds, the governor of the state of Iowa, does proclaim the month of October 2018 as Principals Month and recognizes the essential role that principals play in preparing today's students for the challenges of tomorrow and encourage 
residents to recognize the role principals may have in a child's life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would encourage all of you to stick around for a book <coughs> study today. <laughs> Get a little plug in here. Chapter 3 is about professional learning communities and creating school environments and continuous school improvement and we would like to hear your opinion. <coughs> so please stay if you're able. One more recognition tonight is Ben Large. Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, talk about that. Thanks for being here, Len. Um, <laughs> so received actually notification, I think it was either yesterday or this morning, uh, that Lynn was being commended and her staff for hosting a regional food safety meeting for the area. And so I can let Lynn talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, the training was provided by the Iowa State University Extension, and we were just honored to invite you know folks from around our area, from um, the Tama area and West Marshall area, and then our own staff to um, go through a two-hour long. They called it a boot camp for HACCP, which is all about food safety, and um, that's one of the most paramount things in any food service establishment, but especially when you're serving kids. So it was a good experience to network and learn more about, you know, um, food safety. Congratulations on being <coughs> commended for helping. And representing our district to other districts. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Moving on to the consent agenda. Are there any questions about the minutes of the 25th or October 1st? Any items of note and personnel? Not that I'm aware of. Looking at the interagency agreements and contracts, we have uh, received the payment from the Mark Allen Tai Foundation to help pay the field trip costs for the Hamilton performance in Minneapolis. We have an agreement with ISU for field experience opportunities for teacher candidates. We have a couple students special education students out. Looking at open enrollments, we have four out and two in. Are there any questions on the bills? And no finance report? May I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Harris Hernandez, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the same. The motion carries 6 0. Anybody on the pink sheet? No. Kevin. And He wanted to. Okay. He wanted to what? Give he your report? No. no. No, he didn't want to do that. He wanted to be up here with you. you guys hang around too much. SWAT you. We're starting to act like a <laughs> person a little bit. So we're here to give you a financial update on the Roundhouse Phase 2 project. Um, as you know, we had some allowances built into the project for specific things. Um, you were able to do more than those specific things within those allowances, but all that allowance money has now been spent. 
Um, so now we are moving into some added costs. We have uh, several items. So the first change order uh, is uh, up for your approval. Um, those individual items have actually been approved and implemented uh, in construction, but we need your formal approval to modify the contract with this change order for ball team construction. The, uh, the change order then, we go to the next image there. Now, before you skip ahead, we did make a recommendation that uh, you should have a little over $100,000 that you hold as a contingency uh, for these kinds of added items. So that's what that letter was. It was kind of the letter from the recommendation for award to Baltimore. So this is a change order. It's actually 51 pages long. So there's all kinds of detail there, as much detail as you'd like. I'm sure Janelle has read every page. Um, but it, it is basically made up of five items that total $15,430. Those, those items, um, and we've got some images of some of these. So we discovered some things on the outside of the building, uh, the roundhouse, there is a widened foundation, comes out quite a ways, and because we have some penetrations there, and the stair up against the building, we had to make some modifications. So some of the costs are associated with that. Do you know which picture number? Um, they're kind of in order, so put that one first. Okay, we'll talk about the we'll talk about them as the pictures come up. Okay. Another item was in the loading dock area. You had a wooden stair that was constructed on the right side of the loading dock with a handrail, and we we're concerned that one that wasn't substantial enough. And two, it might be an obstruction. So because there's an emergency exit stair coming out of the wrestling room on the left side, we thought, let's build the stair over here instead. So one of the change order items is to build a new stair, which required removing a, a curb on the side of the existing loading dock, and then adding a rail. So that's a handrail piece. <coughs> So that was a picture where the stair is going to go. This is kind of a backup of what's going on. So you can see on the right side your existing wooden stair. It's just built out of two by twelves. And our thought is, boy, if we've already got this stairwell coming up on the other side, it'd be a lot safer for the trucks back in against the dock to have the stair over there and let's build a real one out of concrete. So those are two of the components. This image shows that thickened foundation. You can see the line where the, where the gray used to be, the dirt used to come up to. It's a little brighter than what was underground. <laughs> and the foundation steps out quite a ways. And in that second segment between the columns of the roundhouse, we have a stair there. We had to move the stair away from the building. And there were some costs to infill between the precast wall and the stair. There's also some costs to repair the wall and in some places to cover it with, uh, with drywall and, and, and finish it. So it's kind of an unknown. It was definitely an unknown. So this is a, an image that shows where the existing underground tunnel was at. The drawings that we had showed that it came out the same depth as the elevator shaft and the elevator shaft is that piece that's got some face brick on it over toward the round house but on the bottom it's concrete so some of the costs to accommodate that actually not being as far out are included in this change order and there are some that we're still negotiating with the general contractor um, it's also lower than we thought it was going to be, so we're adding some more structural foam on top of it. And apparently that's very expensive stuff. Slot windows, that's a future item. There we go, deck. Um, this is a future item that will be coming. This is your Acousta deck. The skinny part of the deck is the top, 
and the wider part of that is the bottom. It's got all those perforations and there'll be acoustical kind of insulation bats inside those. Well, as a result of using this kind of deck, the roofer has to modify their anchorage system. They were hoping to use glue and basically glue the insulation to that, but they're going to have to use anchors and they're going to have to center the anchors on that shorter piece. They've actually offered a credit of a little over fourteen thousand. It'll probably be fifteen to sixteen thousand dollar credit once we once we get it all worked out with the general contractor. So that's a good one. We like those. Um, this is generally a view, if you haven't been inside, once the structural deck is put on, you can see all that perforated deck is up there. Um, there are also some modifications that happen to some of the trusses that the general contractor <coughs> will be asking for some additional um, costing on. We're still negotiating those as well. Another one that's in the future, um, we, we are close to approving this one, the slot windows in the roundhouse. It was very important to a lot of folks that we kept those slot windows. Um, we have to provide a two-hour fire separation. And the phase one was done, the slot windows were taken out, and those spaces were just filled in kind of with concrete and smoothed over. But in our case, we've kept as many as we can. Some are being filled on the side of the addition, the ones that are up at the roof line and hidden behind storage rooms and things like that. The ones that are more exposed, of which there are 14 inside and two on the outside, we are installing a two-hour fire rate of window, custom built window in that slot. Those are extremely expensive windows. We had the windows in the budget. What we didn't have was the fact that what they found is they cannot anchor the windows because of the bevel and the jam. So what the contractor is going to have to do is remove all those 14 slot windows, find a way to re-anchor them about an inch inside the building, further in than they are, and the, the precast panels actually are pretty thin, and then anchor the new windows on the addition side. That, that added cost to be able to do that is going to be almost as much as the credit we're getting on the roof deck. So those two items will offset each other and that'll be in a future change order. Next image. Again, that's another image of the slot window. You kind of see what's really going on on the outside and why it's difficult for them to anchor a new window in there. This is where the opening will be between the two buildings kind of see that right there with the orange tape around it. We just wanted to show, we <coughs> thought it was just the thickness of the precast and the foundation thickness wasn't shown on any of the documents we had. So Kevin, some of those windows you were just referring to, are, are they shown in that picture? We have another image. The drawing? Yeah, we have a, that drawing. There we go. So all the windows that are in orange on <coughs> this, that is, <coughs> That is the 14 interior ones where we're adding the two hour glass. The yellow ones and the plain white ones on the inside, those are gonna be filled on the addition side. You'll still see the glass inside mm -hmm. the roundhouse. And then on the left side of the picture, a couple of the windows that are above the new vestibule, one's actually right next to the wall, it's kind of drawn into the marker. That's one of them. The other one is up above. Those are where we're adding new windows, the fire rated windows, because there's a five foot dimension from the addition that the window has to be away from before you don't get that uh, one hour rating. So have they already manufactured those 14 windows? 16, yes. 16, they're already done? So they're already done. All right, never yeah. mind that. We, told them to order those two months ago yeah. because we were going back and forth on this. The original Understood. cost was about 30,000 to add, now it's about 15. So we're to the point where they, they'll need to be installed. Soon. Yep, okay, thank you. Okay. What other images do we have? I think that was about it. That was good. Okay. Oh, uh, there is one other item that's in the change order, and that is related to light poles. Um, it's, 
it's a little bigger item than we thought it was going to be. I think it's somewhere between one and two thousand. But uh, we ordered the same light poles that you were ordering from the south side of the building around the uh, drills statue. The light poles weren't here at the time, so we were just given a, a page. The electrical engineer missed one item on the spec sheet that it wasn't identified. That was part of the original order uh, that the school district made, so that it wasn't included in their bid documents. So to get that extra collar piece, um, that's one of the that's one of the pieces of this uh, change order. So in the future, um, we expect that there will be several small change orders. Um, we're aware of about five right now that have costs that we're negotiating and a couple more that we don't know what the costs are yet. We expect that there will be two more change orders. Um, there will be another one probably in about a month and then we'll save the last one until the end of the job to clean up all those kind of loose ends. The total amount of those, this one is 15,000. The next one we expect is going to be in the range of 25,000. And the third one, we really don't have a forecast for that, but we expect it not to be more than 20,000. So we hope to be well within that $100,000 contingency fund that we recommended you hold. So they're, they're, the upcoming one is 25,000, you think? That's more so the windows? Or is that that one will, well, there's a $15,000 ad for windows, there's a $15,000 credit for roof. Right. And then there's a, about a $19,000 ad for some structural modifications related to where the building was placed and where the tunnel exists. So there are a couple items between your civil engineer is not in agreement with the general contractor sitting in here about the placement of the building. So we've been negotiating some of those structural components. So I think we're going to have about $20,000 in this structural issues. And then we got a few extra smaller ones where we found out that the upper corridor that had the glass wall, there's a terrazzo floor that doesn't come all the way out as far as we thought it did. So we're going to to figure out a finish on about two inches of flooring before the wall starts, little things like that that we're going to discover as we get into it. Any other questions? Okay. This is not listed as an action. Is that problematic for us to bring it back as an action item? Um, to approve the change order officially? Yeah. <clears throat> you can bring it back later if you like. How many of the change orders have already occurred? All the work is completed. May I have a motion to accept the change orders as presented? So moved. Second. The, who is my second? Okay. Um, we are um, process wise, procedure wise, we should hold this until the next meeting. It was not listed as an action item. It's already been done. We're a mere rubber stamp after the fact. We are not approving any change orders to occur. They have already occurred. All of these change orders have been done. And the financial threshold, I think, on the change orders are such that Chuck's had the authority to give the go-ahead, but given this was the first official changeover beyond the allowances that were built into the project, as a formality, we we'll wanted to bring that forward, but we simply neglected to put Action on the Is there any board member um, opposed to doing this motion tonight? If so, if you want it to wait, we'll wait. No, I'm okay. Marina, Sean, good, good. Uh, motion has been made by Carter, seconded by Heitman to approve the change orders. 
All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same. The motion carries 6 0. All of these things have previously been vetted with the representatives in attendance of the facilities meetings as well. So we've been probably discussing this for a couple months in terms of where we're at and where we're headed and that sort of thing. I think we've been talking about the windows since day one. Yeah, pretty close. <laughs> we've been negotiating all these items for a very long time. And at, at certain points, we tell them, order the materials give us the invoices for the materials, that kind of thing. So we know exactly what the real costs are, and then we negotiate on what the appropriate costs are for, for the other pieces that are harder to measure. Your purpose today is not to seek our permission. Your purpose today is to inform the public. Yes. We have so done with it. Okay. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Thanks. Ladies, would you be so kind as to come and share with us? <laughs> so today we're here to give you an update about the Hamilton trip you guys heard last time and also the art trip and some upcoming events. Were those really painted or was that just an overlay? Oh, we just put a picture over okay. the trip. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. I was lucky enough to be able to go on the Hamilton trip in Minneapolis. It was a week and a half ago. It was a wonderful experience and I am very grateful for the opportunity. For many students it was their first time leaving the state and for most people it was their first time seeing a show. So that made the day extra special. The day was very educational. I think every person was moved by the performance. It was so cool to see everything we have learned in history class be connected to such an exciting performance. I know since then many kids have been uh, listening to the soundtrack over again and reading the lyrics. So the day will definitely continue to have long-lasting impacts on our education. In addition to the show, we got to hear from the cast during the question and answer session. They talked about what it was like to play such iconic figures. That was really interesting and inspiring to many of us as well. Overall, the day was a huge success and I think every student is appreciative for the opportunity. Are you going to sing some of the numbers? I'm going to sing. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Jane, was it just high school students at the performance? Or was it a regular performance and you just got it, seats to that show? It was all high schoolers there, okay. but it was a normal show. So. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the day she came back, I left with a group of 50 students to Chicago. Um, we got the opportunity to um, tour around different like, facilities that had artwork in them. Some of them include the National Museum of Mexican Art and the Art Institute of Chicago. So the students got the opportunity to go around by themselves and like look around. And then after like an hour and a half, we got all together and then we got to tour the actual school. Um, and then after that, we went to Navy Pier where we got to spend another hour and a half looking around and then set our way back home. So I'm going to talk about the Latin dance group, which I feel like is a great um, club that has been around for now. A lot of people didn't know about it, and Miss Santana sponsors it. So if you weren't there for the pep rally we had um, upcoming to the homecoming, they performed, and I was really amazed at how well they did, um, coming from like a Mexican um, background. Um, they grew in members after the performance, and oh, last year they didn't have a lot of members. I feel like it wasn't really um, like brought out, or a lot of people didn't really know about it. So a lot of people didn't go out and seek information about it. And it showcases different styles of dance, and it grew 
um, in members. And before the performance, it only had 10, and it tripled in size to 30 and more members. So I'm really excited about that. And also I interviewed, um, just talked to Daisy. She was our homecoming queen, and she's a part of the group too. And she said that it's going really well, and she loves how they can all incorporate their ideas into dances, and there's a lot of different types of dances, and it's just a really fun group. And she's a senior. And these are some of the upcoming activities and events. Um, this week we have uh, the football team, and it's the last home game. And also, Student Senate will host the trunk or treat on Halloween from 5.30 to 6.30. And this is where a bunch of clubs and sports just come together and um, represent MHS. And also, the Latin Dance Group will perform at Dancers Against Cancer at the North Grand Mall on November 3rd. So it's really exciting to see them just not come in the high school, but go out and um, explore other places to perform. Any questions? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. We have enjoyed two PowerPoints from you. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks for sharing in that manner. Mr. Gosselinga. Welcome. Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity again to um, talk to you a little bit about Marshalltown Learning Academy. Uh, but we could go to the certified count overview slide. Um, this kind of gives you the, the demographic um, breakdown of the snapshot of MLA on that day. Uh, you can see the slide there. Uh, it's a pretty diverse school. Fair number of uh, different uh, groups and kids represented in the building. I think probably one of the more important numbers is at the very bottom of the slide. When we talk about the uh, mobility of the student body um, in our alternative program, the mobility of the student body approaches 100% in the course of the year, which means that. Because the move-ins, move-outs, props, and ads, the student body almost completely turns over from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, uh, which is a uh, pretty difficult challenge when it comes to trying to uh, maintain continuity in education and continuity in programming and things like that. So uh, a lot of the things you'll see here, um, you kind of have to look at through the lens of that mobility as we look at some of the other data that I'm going to show you. So on the next slide, um, we have a relatively small number of ELL students as compared to other buildings um, in the district. However, we do have 24 special education students that are being served by the two teachers in our building. Um, so we have a uh, fairly high concentration of students with IEPs um, in our setting. Uh, three migrant students, one homeless student so far this year. Um, and our uh, extracurricular activity participation um, is fairly low. 90% uh, of our kids don't participate in extracurricular activities. About 8 to 10% do. Um, we have had some success connecting kids to um, music programs and some athletics um, at MHS, um, soccer in particular. But in general, most of our students, because they're working or parenting or otherwise circumstances, are not participating in extracurricular activities in our school system. So um, MLA, as you notice on the first side, um, is a building that serves an almost exclusive at-risk population. Um, one of the indicators for being at risk, and there's four, 
disconnectedness to school, test scores, grades, behavior, achievement. One of the uh, things that rings that bell is attendance. Uh, so to get to MLA, generally you have to have, I would say at least probably below average attendance. Um, so the data here bears that out. Um, we have a concentration of kids from our grades 9 through 12 um, who struggle being connected to school and attending school. And as of this, the data snapshot I took of this on about, oh, I would say it was about September 28th or 29th that I pulled this data. Um, more than half of our students are on, tar on target to be considered chronically absent throughout by the end of the school year, which would be 15 or more days of school missed and 180 days of school. Kind of on a, on a brighter note, um, if we can get them there, we generally don't struggle with them in terms of um, major behaviors. Um, last year, 94% of our students had zero or one referrals for major behaviors. We had 22 major behavior incidents in our, in our uh, school last year, and that involved a group of 15 students. So um, when you sort out the data, some of the kids who had majors only had one, and there was just a couple of kids that there was a concentration of more. So 94% of our students don't have major behaviors at school, which is uh, helpful. In terms of bullying and harassment, last year we had two founded situations that met the criteria in the state around bullying and harassment. So we had two situations like that, which given our numbers means 2%. We're trying to achieve that district goal of 1%. So that's where we stand with bullying and harassment. Um, student achievement, and this number bounces around quite a bit from year to year because of the relative size of the number of people in any particular grade. 2017-18 um, number was a little lower than it typically is. But about half, 48% of our 11th graders were proficient in reading. And we, um, through our PLC process, were undertaking a school-wide note-taking structure and note-taking strategy uh, to help kids organize their thoughts and be more efficient in learning. And we try to use our personalized, individualized structure to provide immediate support to kids who are struggling. One of the difficulties with this data is if you if I could bring you back to that mobility data, is that's a 2017-18 number. So some of those 11th graders that were reflected in that number aren't in our building anymore. They're gone. So it's uh, hitting a moving target when you're trying to structure building-wide interventions and things and trying to understand the students that you have at this time. So when you look at math achievement, we were striving for 75 percentage achievement at the district level in the 11th grade. At uh, Marshalltown Learning Academy, um, about 52% of our 11th graders are proficient in math. Um, we are implementing, as they are at the high school, um, the math intervention called tiered algebra, which is an evidence-based intervention that's highly supportive of kids who are trying to learn algebraic concepts. Um, one of the other things that um, impacts kids in our building is when you're taking those standardized assessments, those assessments tend to go to um, go to grade level at grade 11. <coughs> Some of our kids reach graduation requirements in math and then stop taking more math because they find math adverse or they don't feel like they're going to college or things. So um, it's hard to push kids to those higher level, higher level math classes sometimes because they don't have time in their learning. They come to us behind on credits and we have to recover credits and, and we're trying to repair a lot of those basic skills and in that four or five year window where we're serving them, we just can't get them through two semesters of Algebra two, for instance. Um, IPI, um, we have 
IPI data. We're digging through it. Um, so when we're looking at, a, at disengagement, the district's percentage for disengagement is supposed to be just below 2%. Our disengagement tends to be about 5%. Um, we administer what's, um, what Dr. Valentine would call the IPIT, which is the technology version of it because of our blended learning format. So um, disengagement um, would look like in that kind of a setting when we're walking around the room and there's a student on YouTube instead of doing their assignment. That would trigger a, a disengagement tally kind of a situation. So if we have a kid who's not doing what they're supposed to do in that sort of situation, that would be um, that would be the trigger for that number. So and we're actually collecting data tomorrow for this this fall um, data assessment. So what we're trying to do around disengagement is we use our uh, online software to monitor um, disengagement. Um, I've had a uh, number of situations this year where I've had to, um, uh, through the help of our technology department, put some limits on the sites some kids can visit because they lack appropriate discretion and they violate the internet use policy. Uh, we also involve parents and provide information, sometimes even on a daily basis, to parents about um, how engaged was their child in this particular day of school. We have a lot of parents who are interested in that, and they want real-time data, so we are working on doing that work. District-wide graduation rate. Um, since inception, MLA has contributed more than 200 students over the past 10 years towards the numbers of graduates in the district to contribute to graduation rate. Our district-wide graduation rate in 2016-17, which is the last year that state that is available, is 88.5%. I think we did a little better last year in our preliminary analysis, and I hope the number will come out soon to that. Um, <laughs> for a lot of our students, um, the action step around this really sometimes it revolves more around the social emotional learning aspects. Um, we have to create a healthy professional relationship with between one adult in our building, somebody, and each student. And if we can do that, we can hang with them and try to connect with them and encourage them. We have a, a number of students in our building who come to school and are, are of the belief that their life really won't change that much if they get a high school diploma. And our job is to continuously try to push the message um, about educational attain attainment and educational achievement and try to convince them otherwise from what they, they think they know. So dropout rate, 2018-19 um, district dropouts will be no more than 75. Uh, we met our goal in 2016. <coughs> 17, we had a different goal, we had 79. Um, so this year, so far, we've had um, 22 drops in the district between MHS and uh, MLA. Um, I kind of caution people about that number because somebody may have disengaged from school now. Um, they may have gotten a part-time temporary job, the weather will turn bad, they're working corn, they're working somewhere. Um, that job will be done and they'll come back to school. So uh, we have some kids who are, uh, I, I lost a kid last week who got a job roofing because he has to pay his bills. Uh, he's not able to live at home and so, but when the weather gets bad and the roofing doesn't go well, he's, he'll come back to school to finish school. So um, that number is fluid and seems to move around quite a bit. So just a couple of school highlights um, are Board of Education visits are later in the month. Um, some of the things we've done to help engage kids and build some technical skills. Um, this is some of our advanced manufacturing training equipment we purchased with our STEM Vest grant money. Um, there's uh, three programmable logic boards there, those gray three-headed elements on each board. Um, there's lasers, there's a variety of sensors and kids can program those things to uh, help sort various things in a manufacturing kind of a, an assembly sort of a process. Um, there's a uh, laptop computer that kids program to help um, access the programmable logic centers. And, um, so, um, 
that's a really uh, interesting piece of equipment that is um, working to get kids pretty engaged. And then kind of at a, at a different level, what we certainly heard from partners is a number of our students lack some basic technology and mechanical kinds of skills. So we have this mechanical fabrication center. Um, so the red boxes include all kinds of bolts and nuts and screws and washers and a variety of things. Um, can't see the air compressor there, but there's um, training around uh, pneumatics and things like that and air pressures, um, general tool orientation, how to use the tools. There's a vise on the end of the table there. There's a drill there. Um, there's some other various things in the, in the blue drawer to the left. So we push kids through a variety of modules so they become really, really good at using all of the things that are represented on the board. Um, it was a uh, very common refrain from a number of our business partners that basic tool kinds of competencies were really important for kids to access um, programs and access apprenticeships. And so uh, this was especially important from our, um, our partner Alliant. We heard this pretty frequently. You know, a lot of us grew up in an era where we were all using a lot of these tools and just the things that we did. And it isn't as common for kids anymore. So uh, probably half of the students in our building, if I pulled off any one of those things in the top row and said, hey, tell me what this is, they wouldn't be able to tell you what it is. Or know how to use it, or know what it's for. So um, while it seems kind of basic to folks who've been around this for a long time, it's, it's a really good learning tool for our students. Um, they also get some OSHA training as they go through this get some safety training too with using this equipment. So that'll be on display. And the last thing that kind of supports our work-based learning requirements, this was another outcome of our STEM Best grant, is the uh, Bricklayers and Old Allied Craft Workers Local 3 um, sponsored a uh, masonry day. We sent a number of our students there. There's two of our students there um, learning how to um, lay brick and do masons drive by the roundhouse project and see that going on almost every day. So we got some kids some exposure to this and there are some good um, masonry training and bricklaying apprentices, apprenticeship opportunities right here in our community that we weren't even aware of ahead of our grant last year in our community conversations. So um, this event was an outcome of those conversations and we're really pleased that um, we got this going and uh, they included a number of surrounding school districts as well, so really excited that things like this are starting to happen for our kids. So our goals are pretty broad ranging. Um, and it comes down to what do we want for our kids. We're trying to promote um, upward mobility, both educationally and economically, and some of the strategies we're trying to use there because of our attendance issues and because of some of our kids' past experiences with, with school and everything, um, we're also trying to work on just the fundamentals of improving attendance and improving achievement, which are the goals of every school. But it's especially important for the students that, that I serve that, that we really focus on. Questions for Mr. Gosling? Oh, you said there's 108 students. How, how many of the 108 are categorized as seniors, Eric? Um, we probably have, in terms of 12th graders there, probably about 50. Okay. Now they would be 12th grade in their progression through the building. They wouldn't necessarily have the requisite credits to graduate yeah. this year. The categorized, okay. Just for reporting purposes, that's that's how we keep cohorts and groups together as we track our data. Okay. They're, they're probably a bit top heavy with older kids because historically it was a program that catered primarily to kids that would or should have been juniors and seniors with probably entry level being somewhere around the sophomore year. But we had quite a few discussions about you know, most of the kids that 
have accessed that program or, or determined to be potential good fits for the program, probably were showing similar characteristics as early as middle school. So Eric's been working uh, very closely with the middle school to help identify prospective MLA students uh, upon finishing eighth grade. And I think it's probably fair to say it's a little bit more balanced right now than what it had more been as a result of that. Yeah. And you know, by taking more of a proactive approach of students moving in versus falling into the program after having failed at the high school, I know that in conversations, uh, many of those students performed relatively well as freshmen last year. So some of the things that you're doing to improve attendance um, we we started using the uh, attendance auto dialer which is a notification system um, the, the scope of the problem is so big that it's just not like I can have a secretary call and reach all these folks but rather than using the auto dialer at five o'clock in the afternoon if you have a high school student we're using it at 10 o'clock in the morning so if we don't see somebody and, we're, and we get them marked absent we're during the day, reaching out to parents. Um, we use a lot of email to text to families, which is uh, a lot of our families or our parents who are working cannot take phone calls by the nature of the jobs they have. But they'll see a text message on a break or something like that, and then they're able to respond to that. And that's a lot easier for them than checking even a voicemail. So we do that. Um, we. Um, the other kind of way that we play that is, is, is through some of the STEM best work and the work-based learning stuff that we're trying to do. Um, we have to generate some hope. We have to generate the, uh, the notion that this is worth your time, it's worth your investment, that this is achievable, that you can do some, some good things. Um, so like the STEM best grant, getting those, that training equipment into the building with some of those hands-on things, that's something that's just a really different way to capture some interest that some of our kids have. Is transportation the problem, or is, do they provide transportation for the lake? Um, our kids ride the buses like other students. Being in the middle of town, sort of, and with the three mile exclusion zone, um, I know like to the west of us, you have to live like past the apple orchard, you know, mm -hmm. to qualify for transportation. Um, I'm not, prepared to say, I don't have the data to say that transportation is a significant issue. It's episodically a problem for some of our kids. I would say that our students seem to be able to find a way to get where they need to go for lots of other things. So I would expect them to invest that same kind of energy into getting, getting to school. So I, I'm not... <clears throat> I don't have enough data to answer your question fairly, but my initial reaction is every once in a while it's a problem, yes. Is it a persistent problem? Don't know. Do many of the upperclassmen, junior, seniors drive? We have a lot of kids that drive and I'm signing paperwork for school permits and things like that. And I'm taking school permits away. <laughs> People want to be taxis for other kids or do things they're not supposed to do with their school permits. So it's uh, a lot of our kids work as well. So they have, trans they have transportation because they need to get to jobs too. So then by default, they have some transportation to school. We have some bus riders. We don't have a large number of bus riders. We have a lot of kids that walk. Other than fulfilling, you know, the basics, trying to get those leveled out, have you seen any growth in reading and math? Like when you bring ninth graders in and they have a little more individualized attention and so we, support? Yeah, and that. I know I that's hard if you've got a mobile population. <laughs> it is, and, and, and so we were, um, we did some analysis last year at the end of the year, the ninth grade group that we brought in. Um, 
And the, what I compared them to is Miller had prepared a list of students who they thought would, would be successful at MLA, and the list was larger than what we could accommodate. Um, and some, all of those students were offered the option to come to MLA. Some did, and some chose to go to MHS. So I had the two cohorts sort of side by side. Um, the kids that went to MHS had earned, at the end of last year, had earned more credit than the cohort group at MLA on average, but their grade point average was lower. Um, MLA students, and we use kind of a mastery model, so kids have to get it to move on. Um, some of those kids took longer to get it, but when they got it, they had better grade point averages, so it was kind of a... We're hoping that the skill repair work that we were able to do in ninth grade will pay off down the road. So we're kind of tracking that incoming group of kids as they move through MLA, and hopefully enough of them will be there that we can draw some meaningful conclusions from the data. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Professional Development Leader for College and Career Readiness, and tonight I have with me um, Dorinda Bainerton, and I'll introduce herself, what, what she teaches at the high school. I teach the um, tiered algebra that you've already heard about from, um, <coughs> excuse me, from the other high school, and I'm a newcomer. I joined the staff in February. Very good. I just want to tell you, I am not planning to talk about every slide that I had in my my, I don't want you to panic, okay? Um, I just wanted to give you some information, and there's just some high, slides I'm going to highlight, but I wanted you to know um, the statistics of, of the teacher's feedback, and you can read that on your own time if you would like. Um, if you look at our interesting facts, first of all, I just want to thank um, Dr. Schutte for coming up with the idea to have a teacher externship, and he asked me to um, take the lead and plan this um, event. Um, it was the first Teacher Externship Academy that we've ever had at Marshalltown. And um, we started in February in planning it. As you can see from the facts, there were 23 different area businesses that participated, and there were 43 teachers. Our goal was to hit 50. We had 47 that um, registered, and then, you know, events happen um, in their lives and some things. Two curriculum professional development leaders attended, Pam and Erica um, um, Janelle, um, joined us for a part of the day. And so out of, the, out of the 43 participants, 32 of them received teacher licensure renewal credits. That was something new that we um, offered for them. So 64 total credits were earned and 11,000 in eight hours of professional development learning in the four days. And if you would ask the teachers that attended, they were exhausted by the end of the four days. Um, there are 16 career sectors that um, we could have explored, but we um, selected four of them that we um, investigated because those are the ones where the biggest demands of jobs are in the trend um, going on in Iowa right now. I want to share with you a, a, a short video that Andrew Potter made and he came to visit us and I might need you Josh to. So it just gives you a quick um, view of what the teachers experienced in those days. Anyway, while they're doing that, um, we started every morning at 8 o'clock and we went till 4 o'clock and we loaded up on school buses and went to our different, we had two cohorts, sometimes we had to divide into two groups and sometimes we stayed together. There are some places that we could not have pictures of, like Emerson and Fisher, um, but we were very grateful for those that allowed us to take some pictures and show um, um, what we did throughout the four days. Here in Marshalltown, uh, we have roughly 50,000 square feet. Uh, 
uh, we'll talk about what all we have here and, and kind of our expansion going on. Uh, we also have sites in Fayetteville, Arkansas, uh, a factory and a distribution center. Um, and, and then we take that and we trim it in a press, kind of a stencil comes down, and the stencil is the exact shape of this trowel. And that makes a 33 knot. United States. Uh, 50 of them have corrugators, which you'll be able to see today. We own six mills. Uh, we have 13,000 employees, and you know, we're at eight, nine, whatever day of the week, 10, 13 billion dollar plan. You know, first of all, if you show up every day, we probably got a place for you because attendance is very important, just like it is in school. are going to be invaluable. The students need to be able to see what's available for them 
especially within their own community, um, so that they can just take it, and they can dream, they can learn how to dream. four days of how um, our <coughs> teachers would make statements that I had no idea that this is what was happening in these businesses. And um, we have a lot to be proud of here in Marshalltown as towards what's there to offer for jobs um, and different types of jobs for our teachers or for our students. When we looked at our objectives, we were wanting to have the teachers synthesize potential career opportunities and skills necessary for different jobs and careers and make connections with their content. That was really the sole purpose. What they're teaching, how it connects to careers and jobs. And then also identify potential business people that could provide um, learning opportunities in their own classroom. And so we gave them time at the end of the day, um, after touring all day, um, to sit down and create plans and ideas for incorporating them into their curriculum. And we gave them time to collaborate with other colleagues about college and career readiness indicators. And so I wanted to have a teacher come and present with me tonight. So I asked Dory if she would come. And she's going to speak a little bit about what she um, has planned for her math um, students, but also what she even did today um, for her. So Dory? I hope I can get my voice back. I've not had it since last Wednesday. Um, good evening, and thank you for having me come. I've moved around the country. I'm a, a wife of a college coach, and so I've taught in about nine different schools in about eight different states. And this has been the first time that I've really been invited into a community um, and very successfully um, have enjoyed looking at how the businesses are very connected to the school district and supporting the kids that they have within the district themselves. And so I was excited to see that, and I wanted to see the kids see that as well. Um, like I said earlier, I do teach the integrated, um, the tiered algebra, so it's the beginning ninth grade students that are struggling with their algebra, they're with their math. But I don't think it's just that. They're struggling in connecting with their community and connecting with what do I want to do with the rest of my life. And so when I was going through and on this externship, seeing what the businesses were saying, my students need to see that as well. They need to see that the businesses that are around them have a place for them, that they have um, goals, and that if they don't just get everything the first time, that they can help them um, reach those goals on their job sites and begin to train them there. So the first person that came today to speak to the kids was Maria Morales from the workforce, Iowa workforce. The class that I was able to sit in on, because they didn't come to my math classroom, the kids have another period called their math center, and they have a kind of a tutoring period. And she was there to speak with them. No one had ever heard of the area that she is a part of. And not only can they use her resources, but so can their families. Um, it was excellent to have her just talk it wasn't even about what she does personally, but about her life and how her life really connects to what they personally have experienced. Um, so that connection alone has started on the path that we continue, will continue this year um, and looking forward to see where the kids can go. So like I said, to have them dream is important to be able to go, okay, if you don't, you know, just because you struggle in math doesn't mean that you won't be able to reach a goal. Um, those soft skills we can still teach you and go on from there. And I think the plan is to have um, other speakers come into the Mass Center that um, we make connections with with the externship, but also bring Maria back to help them with some um, developing resumes, filling out applications, and helping them see kind of where do you start. And I think Maria, when I walked over there today to listen to her, she talked about her life stories and the obstacles, but who provided resources for her to get through those obstacles. And um, I commend Dory and Michelle um, Marie Trowbridge for um, seeing the need for this, and we'll see where it goes. And we, I do know that there's another teacher I asked her to come, but it, the event isn't going to be until next week, but at Rogers Elementary, they have a family night, and she's bringing in um, Farm Bureau to do some of the um, 
and in the classroom. So I think that'll be good. Um, I'm not going to say that I go through each day, but you can go through and you can see we had a very, very full schedule every day. Um, and the panel discussions were human resource representatives that talked about those soft skills that our students need to develop. They can teach them some of the skills that are needed on the job, but the soft skills and the interpersonal skills, skills is what we need. Um, and it was just very, and um, different businesses provided a meal for the teachers, so we made it a working lunch. So here's the Ag Day. And as you can see from the charts, the teachers, um, the responses were very high for what they felt they could apply to their um, classroom. And of course, we got to see the, the police and the fire department and the roundhouse, and that was very interesting to everybody. Um, the health career, I, I should go back up. The, uh, the advanced manufacturing, we were going to have Lennox, but due to the tornado, um, they were unable to um, accommodate us. And so um, Dr. Shudi talked with PCA, and that was, they were so excited that they were included in there, but we hope to bring back Lennox at some time in this event. You can read through some of the reflections, but um, it was very enlightening to them, and I think they they felt that this was an opportunity that 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 was different than anything they'd ever experienced before. So often before school starts, we have classes that do more about strategies and more about curriculum, and this was very different, and it provided them an opportunity to think outside the box about what they can do for their students and how they can talk to them about these careers. With the emphasis on college and career readiness and Bobcat Ready, um, we, we really need our teachers talking to students about how this applies to a career. Um, the other thing is for the future, we're hoping to expand this. Um, we've already are talking about the information technology, computer science, and adding business management and finance to our um, externship next year. We'd like to continue with the four clusters that we had. We haven't decided exactly how we're going to format it all, but um, we are going to reach out to different community uh, businesses and see once how they can participate in this externship. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm ex extremely passionate about this area. As Dr. Shudi knows, I was a former CTE teacher of FCS, and this was the basis of our education. And with the Iowa Future Ready emphasis going on right now, this is the direction that we need to be heading, and that is making the connections between um, careers and our classroom curriculum. Um, we're working hard on work-based learning opportunities for our students. We need to make sure that the students have hope, just like Dory mentioned. They need to have hope that there are great paying jobs right here in Marshalltown for the students. They need to develop the skills that are necessary to be employable. And hopefully as we partner together with all of the businesses and the future businesses that we have, that we can continue to build relationships and give teachers more information, more opportunities for them to include the businesses in their teaching. And I hope that as our mission statement says, what we said tonight about preparing all learners through an unparalleled culture of excellence to be productive and engaged citizens in a diverse world. Diverse world. Our students need, they need the hope, but they also need to see that they can be totally engaged in their education by seeing what they can do with the math, with the um, language arts, with the social studies, with the arts, with the um, electives that they take. That can often lead them to a career path that they had no idea what their possibilities were. So um, once again, I thank um, Dr. Shudi again for <coughs> having this idea and that it got to be a chance to be implemented and the teachers took the um, upon themselves to take four days out of their summer to come and learn. And we look forward to this coming summers as well. Thank you. Any questions? Great job. It's awesome. Thank you. As Dia mentioned, the, <coughs> the decision on those job sectors was based on what's in the highest demand in terms of available jobs within Marshall County. So that's how we fell upon those four initial job sectors and then the inclusion in the future of computer and information science and um, 
business slash finance slash insurance are the next two <coughs> job sectors that fall in line there. So it's a natural fit for others that help us with the planning as well. I think one thing that we learned is that four days is a big commitment. It was exciting that 43 people were willing to to vote for what would otherwise been summer um, to pursue this, and so many of them benefited by being able to get license renewal credit. That I think what we're looking at potentially going forward is breaking them all down into two-day segments, and so in doing that, for example, next year someone could still do four days if they desire to, and we have enough people signing up for those two-day sessions. Uh, and, um, or they could just do a two-day session. I know that we had some people that had indicated that, you know, if it were two instead of four, they could have done it for one reason or another. So um, I think there's some great potential there, too. We also didn't open it up for our brand new employees. So you had been here for a semester, so you're able to do it. But those that were just entering into our mentoring and induction program needed to go to the mentoring and induction and not the academy. So. You know, there's 20 some potential uh, people that would benefit from learning more about Marshalltown through there. And, and again, I think breaking it into two day segments or four day, I think a lot more of our staff will probably be willing to do two days. So. I should also mention so I've been in contact with several of the businesses that were involved with the externship in developing a work based learning um, relationship with them and trying to place students in their um, businesses. That, that was um, the potential that this you know, opportunity had for, for myself and Nicole Critchfield and also the teachers now have um, a place where they can start with bringing in guest speakers, maybe doing a field trip, maybe just having a relationship with someone who comes into their classroom on a regular basis and talks to them. So there's lots of possibilities. Okay. Thank you so much. from the Iowa Community Action, and I, too, am not going to go through all the slides that I've provided. Those are more for your information and, and reading pleasure as you um, learn more about the opportunity. Um, first of all, thank you to Dr. Schutte and the school board for continuing the support of our partnership and the opportunity to share with you tonight. Um, a few of the highlights of the work we've been selected to do uh, for the next five years by the Federal Department of Education. On July 13th, it was Friday the 13th, uh, we submitted an application to the Federal Department of Education as an applicant for the Full Service Community Schools Grant. This funding source allows programs or schools or community partners to expand, coordinate, and enhance services to pr improve academic success. Then the tornado happened and our whole lives changed. But then on Friday the 28th, we were notified that out of 121 applicants, Marshalltown received the Department of Ed grant. Um, we are one of 15 that were selected, and our project was ranked ninth um, in the country for the award process. So we're pretty proud of that selection. But what we'll do, we're going to work in three school buildings, um, Anson, Woodbury, and Rogers, as these three buildings have the highest percentages of students affected by the conditions of poverty, and that was using last year's school data. And that was also a requirement of the grant to serve the highest poverty schools. Our focus will be on supporting school readiness, improving student attendance, enhancing summer learning, and facilitating parent engagement, all very sim similar to our community's grade level reading work that we've been doing for the past several years. All of this work will be done in collaboration with the school and community partners. The project itself will have one bilingual coordinator that will be at each elementary building and an attendance specialist that will work across these buildings. It is our goal that at the end of this project, students and their families will be highly engaged in school and community and that the community is able to support and address the needs of our students and families. We have an amazing opportunity to continue the success of what we know works for our students and be able to scale up those opportunities along with moving to the next level 
and ideas and projects, we have strong evidence to meet our goals. Is there any questions? <laughs> Short and sweet. Get to the point. So it's a five-year program. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, yeah, a five-year program. Um, Micah is the grantee, and we will be um, working in three um, specific areas um, around school readiness, um, academic proficiency, and increasing student safety, health, and support of parent engagement. Um, we really are focused on some activities that you've heard us talk about before, um, expanding Bob Pack University. Um, that's a huge piece of our work, um, not only to, to serve more children over longer periods of time. Um, really looking at that important um, milestone of school transition and making sure every child is prepared for school. Um, and also parent engagement with expanding our Aprendo Puertas or Opening Doors um, leadership training um, that will include um, facilitating alumni groups and, and building parent trainers as well. So it just kind of builds and expands. Um, and a really strong focus on um, coordinated attendance and really focusing on students at risk of chronic absenteeism and creating strategies to address, address that um, issue. How did you determine those three schools? Sure, sure. And it's, it's all about the, the data on the poverty levels of the community. So those were our highest levels of poverty using last year's data. And the funding, you know, you had to have a coordinator and some things in place at each building, so that is as far as we could go with, with the funding that was available was three buildings. At first, we only thought it was two, so it was nice to be able to get to three buildings. Our hopes ultimately will be that many of the things that we're doing, we can figure out yes. a way over the period of time to replicate it at other buildings, because more of our buildings are looking similar mm -hmm. you know, versus different in terms of the um, level of poverty or, or economic challenge so um, we're super excited to have you know the opportunity uh, to further enhance our supports for these buildings in these areas particularly as it relates to attendance mm -hmm. so are we is that does the money fund a resource or resources it's it's really about coordination and bringing in um, and, and identifying supports that can help. So the the coordinator's job is to bring all of these services and expand those services to school. So um, it's really about staff and then thinking about Bobcat University staffing more teachers, um, parent trainers. I'm trying to think of what other things. That, um, not necessarily things but uh, um, opportunities so we're not we're not funding a resource inside the school district for this like correct? a person you mean correct yeah. the um, building coordinators of which there'll be a bilingual building coordinator at all three buildings to help uh, work with counselors principals social mm -hmm. workers to um, access resources that are available in order to be a resource and then the attendance specialist or monitor will actually be shared across the building so they too will work in conjunction with the team of people to so these are new positions yes it'll yes. be funded through this yes okay and then at the end of the five years we'll have to find a different way to yeah either to fund it or find a different way to provide those services okay Sorry, I did. I. That's all right. Thank you. <laughs> so the coordinator is yeah. looking for services within the community or state yes. that we aren't already using, it, or, or bringing a more systematic way to bring those. So, for example, um, Micah implements a low-income home energy assistance program that you have to go to a different location to get. But could we create a way for families to use the school or another way to offer that kind of service? So thinking differently and out of the box about how to break services to families. Okay. Other questions? May I have a motion to approve the full service community school grant as presented? So moved. Second. Fletcher Carter, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same? It wasn't Fletcher. 
it was. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Uh, opposed the same? The motion carries 6 0. Thank you. Great, thank you. I look forward to coming back with updates as we come along with our information. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would our principals and Mr. Kretzinger please join us? Mick, would you like to join us while you're here? May I have a motion to approve the full service community school grant as presented? Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Abstentions? That's you. Yes. The motion carries 501. Did you get that? We just changed it all. Thank you for pointing that out. Reminding all of us. <laughs> okay. So, as you'll remember, Chapter 2 focused a lot on the district and district administration and district support, including the board for um, the PLC process. Chapter 3 talks a lot about the principal's role uh, in this process, uh, for which it, some of that was woven through chapters uh, 1 and 2 as well. Great to have principals to help talk about this, yeah. about their world. Um, so um, at the last meeting, we just kind of threw it out there in terms of things that caught your attention and that stuck out to you as points of importance. Um, we can open it up that way to either board members and or uh, the administrators that are here. Let's open it up to principals first. <laughs> what? information uh, maybe if I can just rephrase that a bit uh, I would be most interested in what your role is in the PLC's that are operating in our schools this is the board's first exposure to PLC's from that standpoint and did you agree with the content of this chapter or is it really not like that So Linehan is one of the, um, we went to the PLC training in Minneapolis this summer. And so this is our beginning of our journey. And one of the things that I think I learned um, quite a bit about is looking at the building capacity and building a collective capacity. So it's not just the leader or the ordained leader of the building, but we're all leaders in this process of learning about how to figure out and know about our essential standards, um, what are kids learning, are they learning it, and what are we doing if they're not learning it. And then the extension portion of it is, you know, if they already have it, they already know the essential standards, then how do we move forward with even going above and beyond for them? So I think that was a very important point to make and out of the 21 processes i think it's on whatever page it was you know most of those types of activities or strategies or supports can be provided um, through this um, plc framework so i thought that was important to know and be able to share i thought um the the thing that struck me about the chapter is the, the notion that there are 21 actions, leadership actions that principals perform on a regular basis in their buildings. And I think, um, I think that's true. There's this constant tug between leadership and management, which are two relatively, that while they're interrelated, they're really not the same function. And sometimes the more the, the needier your students or 
more dysregulated your students can be, the more you have to move into a management mode as opposed to a leadership mode. That's that's important. Um, I think the other big thing about the chapter that led me to take some actions in my own building is um, the notion of teacher isolation, which has been a long established practice by the, the way we've done school for a long time. So I have um, moved some people's cheese, I guess, a little bit would be a nice way to say it. And I have um, people in interrelated subject areas uh, sharing the same instructional space for the first time. 10 years we can open um, to try to break down some of those barriers so my uh, work-based learning person and my STEM person share a space with my science teacher and my ELL teacher and social studies teacher collaborate and my one of my special education teachers who also has an English certification is then sharing this space with the language arts teacher so all teaching in the same spaces which is really to get at that issue of <coughs> Isolation. Okay. <laughs> my whole uh, it, my, it, teaching and administrative experience goes back to the early 80s, so <coughs> I've got kind of a long term view of a lot of these topics. Um, I even figured out a way in the 90s to get a doctorate out of this topic, basically. Distributed leadership. Has, uh, has long been a topic of, um, of um, interest in education because one person cannot necessarily have all the answers for an organization or for helping each child achieve their uh, destiny for, for um, being a, a strong student and knowing all of the skills and knowledge we're trying to teach with them. So, um, you know, the influence that a principal has is a little bit like a juggler, juggling the balls and uh, trying to be there at the right moment when uh, the process needs a boost and uh, the process of um, trying to help teachers uh, be responsible and being uh, leaders in themselves toward uh, every child succeeding. Uh, is, is really important to me. We've been through an era where uh, the past 15 years or so where that wasn't necessarily the case. Um, someone somewhere knew all the answers for education and for kids and, and we were supposed to march in certain orders and I, I'm really delighted to see um, to the, the concept of shared leadership, shared responsibility for kids' success reemerging on our landscape because uh, the answer is, is all about we, not me. And um, to, to think that, um, um, that one, one person can design and, and lead all that is important. Now, I might be a little naive. I've been sometimes called naive, I guess. Um, but I can tell you teacher isolation is not what it was in the 1980s. Uh, it's very difficult. I would say in this era for teachers really to remain totally isolated because uh, back in that era the person was the curriculum the person was the entire program uh, there was very little interaction in many cases uh, with in a you know if it was a small school the one person was the entire department uh, and so as each person was hired came different curriculum there came different goals at that time now we interact constantly and uh, interact in a much deeper fashion than ever before about what is it kids are really supposed to learn and how are we going to get there and uh, you know just look what social media has done we're doing that inside the educational system as well as we work together to reach our goals so um, just a, just some observations I've had that, that um, you know the PLC concept isn't really terribly new but it, it does have kind of a new packaging uh, to involve uh, teachers, principals, and working together in collaborative ways that, uh, that really is essential to help us meet our goals. Comments from board members, further questions for the principal? Jump right in. 
I think it's um, it's not something that happens overnight and so kind of like Liz said we've got people at different junctures that are getting more formalized training I'm sure in addition to that we'll have opportunities for everyone to have you know similar foundational um, learning experiences that maybe don't have the opportunity to go to a, a summit and I, and I think there's an evolution of it uh, first and foremost is to make sure that people are uh, working collaboratively towards common goals and then secondly it's uh, making sure that we're using good high quality formative assessment we're looking at meaningful data in order to make those determinations uh, that Liz uh, mentioned uh, whether students are struggling or whether they already have it and how do we better differentiate our instructional approaches so that all kids are being met whether they're lower on target or higher achieving kids, uh, which is certainly an ultimate goal. And then, um, and you know, I think ideally it's building leadership capacity in others so that it, it's not just the teacher or the principal, not just the uh, counselor, you know, that are put in those positions of facilitating the meetings. This was an integral part of the vision for the teacher leadership and compensation, whether you called it PLC or not, it was to bring people together and to have teachers working and leading teachers in addition to being provided support from uh, administration and others um, and, and compensating them for those extra efforts. Because as Meg said, we've always had in some way, shape, or form these different groups, but sometimes the amount of time that was able to be put in was limited by things by no additional pay or not having the appropriate people in those positions and and uh, you know I've seen in, in each of this district as well as my last district uh, kind of a resurgence of people wanting to do these types of things versus thinking that the only way they can get ahead is by going and getting an administrative degree and that sort of thing so I think it's been a, exciting to uh, to watch this evolve, and I think, you know, if we bring uh, people back a year from now, I think you'll hear even a little bit different take based on where we're at at that point in time. Um, your your comment, Mick, about the isolation changing, because as I was reading that, it it, it kind of dawned on me um, when I think of my company, I can get up any time during the day and go ask somebody a question where I can learn, I can share, I can ask a question about best practice. It's, it's constant opportunity of collaboration. And as I was reading that, I'm sitting there thinking, if I'm a teacher, I don't get that opportunity as openly as someone does because you have students in the room and you can't just say, hey, I'm not really sure. I'm going to go leave the classroom for 25 minutes and go ask my counterpart about something. So I th how do you, when is the opportunity for the informal collaboration? Not the formal where you're going to a school, you're going to a class, or you're going to a seminar, but the informal collaboration that breaks up this, you know, where you're, you're stuck in the room. A lot, of, a lot of the answer to this is all about culture in a school the culture of the constant conversation about challenge to, to continue to try to strive for bigger and better for outcomes for kids. Mm -hmm. So it happens at lunch, it happens at, at before school, it happens after school, it happens over the internet, uh, not just within a school, but between schools, between districts across the nation, in the world now. Uh, it goes on constantly. And, one of the things that in our building that we're very proud of is that constant conversation about what we're doing and how to do it better. And we find ways. But it's just, it's not the same as it was at one time where literally we didn't have facilitative ways to have those conversations beyond face-to-face. -face. Now it's face-to-face, -face, now it's electronic, now it's, it's all kinds of media that's involved. You know, teachers pay teachers, uh, all kinds of different, uh, different medias that way involved now. I think the 
<clears throat> the key is we're trying to build in more formal ways for them to meet. In some cases, it might be natural to be able to structure their schedule so that their planning times are aligned so it could be done during the, the regular day. In some cases, it might be before school meetings or after school meetings, weekly or biweekly or whatever. Um, so, and that's really key to the success of this um, is finding those times for people to collaboratively get together and when the trust is there and the energy is there to work collectively to identify issues um, that need further research and or development and they work together in order to identify what is it that we need, how do we get it, how do we provide it or have or work with the principal to provide that for us for what we need at this point in time to help kids. And then, um, you know, it, it emanates into their own personal learning, which it has deep meaning because it's addressing issues that they have, which could be unique in one building versus another or within one grade level versus another uh, as well. When it's left up to informal, that's when you tend to see some people that are able to isolate themselves and not proactively seek that out. But you really need both, right? Right. You can't just do one way or the other. Yeah. But you can't, I, I don't think you can totally rely on the structured time either. Right. Because it's never enough. It's never enough for people who are really into the flow of things and really want to strive and figure things out. So I know, I know my teachers stay in contact with each other the weekends, nights. You know, and they're constantly working on improvising and putting putting plans together. So, what are some of the changes you've seen in the last five years that are most impactful? I I would say the the resumption uh, of the common sense that. That people collaborating together can achieve more than just individuals working in parallel. You know, the synergy that comes from common goals, common desires, common common focus. Um, you know, that there there was an era we went through and, and it was all about this way or the highway. And I'm really excited to see teachers now being able to kind of light their fire their internal motivation that really is is the basis for everything that school districts achieve it doesn't come from external motivation it's not about motivators of recognition or pay or or any of those types of things those are just basic needs but teachers are terribly and wonderfully motivated ferociously about the success of their kids and I guarantee everyone that goes home whatever time of day whenever they finally decide to go at home, uh, you know, are reflecting on how did it go today, you know, and what could I do better next time? And that, that again, is partially a culture, and I, I'm just excited to see that relighting of that fire for many teachers right now. It's, it's really exciting. We saw about the in externships. We have all kinds of different things that we're lighting those internal fires with, and there's nothing that can replace that. You know, people that want to succeed find ways. And as long as we take away the roadblocks as best we can. What struck you? Um, well, a couple things. You know, as I was excellent. as I was reading through the book, um, being someone who's worked in a number of districts over my career and and being able to reflect on the folks here, we have some incredible administrators in this district. Truly, you can compare them across the state and they truly stand out. But even some of the best administrators, having the time to do that individual coaching with teacher by teacher it is almost an impossibility. So a structure like PLC gives them the greatest opportunity to have some of that impact by collaborating with teachers. Um, it also took my mind down the road of when administrators sometimes talk with teachers, sometimes there's this nervous energy around because you're not sure if this was a learning opportunity or some kind of coaching cycle going on that can lead down the road of evaluation. Putting teachers together so they can have guided conversations takes away that second worry and really lets them focus on the moment and, and the action they're doing. So those were the things that really popped to mind um, initially. But I do agree with Mick, you know, 
we're seeing fewer and fewer teachers um, that I would say would be disengaging from working with others, not only just from the structures, but because the pendulum has swung a little bit again. So at one time it was um, buildings can all do whatever they feel is best for themselves. Then it swung back to administration drives the boat and no one else has a say. And now we're getting to this, this medium of, you know, there are some rules we all have to play by. But within that, teachers can be creative and working and doing what they feel is best for kids. And I think that's really starting to help our teachers feel energized working with some really hard kids. Other comments? Final thoughts? From you, sir? I've shared a lot of thoughts. Okay. <laughs> well, we won't force you to share more. You don't want to open the door too much. No. Thank you all very much for sharing with us today. Thank you for all you do. Chapter four for next time. Is that your week then? <laughs> we'll see you again. It's time for board policies. As far as the first readings. Two policies that were assigned to them and the three additional ones that have my name attached. We have not made any changes from the initial review. Um, so that would be 6061, 6065, 6038 R1, <coughs> 6057 R1, and 6062. Correct? I believe six or six classes had some changes. The use of information? No, sorry, the student field trip excursion. Field trips. Mm -hmm. We had questions there about written information and not written information. Yeah, there was, I took that back. There was a slight change to that. <coughs> so we do, um, we basically, uh, for the most part, operate with passive permission. They, they want signed off on a blanket field trip at, at registration, but then the onus at which we build into this is on the teachers and our principals to make sure the parents are aware each and every time that a field trip experience comes up, so you're correct. So 6065 field trips will need to come back. But I need a motion for the other four in that group to approve as amended or adopted, as the case may be, uh, and waive the second reading. So moved. Second. Fletcher Heitman, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the same. The motion carries 6 0. Okay. Um, 407.6 and 413.7, which both deal with voluntary early retirement or date adjustments. And Paulette, I think you made those correct. Correct. We are just changing the dates in those policies to match actual practice. So those will need to come back. Um, New policies, 605s. <laughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> we, these are all policies that have to do with instructional materials, and uh, we are looking at adopting, for the most part, what IESB is recommending for those. And I had Dr. Stevenson look these through as well, since that's her arena. A couple of quick questions on those. So the, okay. the ad hoc committees set up by the board, that's different than the, the typical curriculum review committee, right? Correct. Correct. So that would be, be a separate case if for some reason you wanted to? Right, yeah. if we needed to. Okay. And then 
the uh, reconsideration of instruction materials, um, the there's a committee form, there's a, a recommendation made to the superintendent, but then I assume it comes to the board with final decision. Yes. Correct. I, that was my assumption. I didn't. I don't know if it was explicitly said that or if I just didn't read it. But that's as long as that's the. I assume that was the case. Yeah. Let me make sure. Okay. Thanks. That hasn't happened in the district for a really long time. Yeah. Um, the last time it happened was when the Harry Potter books first came. We had some concern about the Harry Potter books, so there was a reconsideration committee form. Yeah. And the recommendation was to keep them. Any other questions on the 605s? 603.8? Um, which is 603.9. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's somewhere that we just made some minor adjustments to align it with IASB language. To come back then. Are there any questions on that one? Okay. Um, I have Paulette look over 704.3 on investment, 705.1 on purchasing bidding. Um, and it, it appears that most of the adjustments again are to align with IESB language on those. And That's Lynn. Um, looked over 710.2 on free and reduced price meals and 710.4 um, and again we sought her guidance in terms of how or what to amend based on the ASB language in our current language so there were adjustments made on those any questions on those four policies because we'll need to come back as well mr harris yep so 6034 regarding homework, uh, there's some very minor wording changes and a number change to line up with IAS IASB. So we added the word community and uh, deleted one other word, I think it was next or that, I can't mm -hmm. remember. So very small, so we'd suggest mark that as reviewed. Sorry, I don't need to come back. That's fine, bring her back. It's a good one. It deserves to come back. <laughs> it's about homework. We love homework. Yes, we do indeed. 6035. 6035 is we're deleting that one and uh, we're merging that into 6051 along with 6036. Both of those will um, become deleted and become 6051, which puts us in with IASB. So that will be a changed policy? It will be correct. Both of those will be merged into a new policy. Okay. So we need to bring back 6051 entitled textbook resource selection? Correct. Okay. 6036E is going to be deleted and replaced as 6053E2. Is that changed enough from IASB or is it just a number change? No, I think there were some changes on that one. It's being deleted and replaced. Yeah, yeah so it's a major okay. change. Yeah. So 6051 is part of textbook and instructional materials. Uh, 6035 and 6036 are now 6051. Okay. Yep. And then 6036E is being replaced, and 603.8 is just a number change. We can mark that one as reviewed. How about that? And as a result of that combination, 603.5 can be deleted, correct? Correct. As can 6036. We can do that at the same time we bring them okay. at the next meeting. Okay. 
lead to in Roman 1. Any questions from anyone? Paulette, are you with us? I sure am. Okie dokie. Mr. Potter, anything of note under communications? Nothing of note. Looking at reminders, the next school board meeting is November 5th. Um, I would like to remind you that you have all received an email from Paula Johnson requesting for you to choose a committee on which to participate in interest-based bargaining. You need to do that. Might I assume that the facilities committee would like to be the facilities IBB committee? <clears throat> sure. Yeah, I, I pretty much suggested that also this morning. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. The other two choices are personnel issues and social emotional student issues. And Sean, I think you're, you've requested social emotional. I don't remember what I, I, I responded. You responded. As I okay. sit here, I could not could. figure what I responded, <laughs> but I did. <laughs> so we need for Karina and Ben to contact uh, Paula. If you don't have that email, I would be happy to forward you it again. Okay. Okay, Karina. Just respond to her, please. I do not have any committees listed since the last meeting. Were there any committee meetings that need to be discussed? Okay. Sean's on for board policies next time. What have we done this evening to improve the education for students in our district? Lots. <laughs> yeah, we did do. Tonight has been a very busy meeting. We have a full service grant we've received. Yep. Good update from Eric and MLA. Mm -hmm. And our tonight was our first school report. Mm -hmm. And Rogers will be our report at the next meeting. Got an update on what will be a fantastic uh, physical addition to the roundhouse mm -hmm. budget. Mm -hmm. My quote tonight comes from Todd Whitaker. I think maybe many of you have heard of the name. Um, this was especially important to me because I had relatives fly in from California and Florida and relatives drive in from Texas, but I had a lot of relatives, close family relatives on an airplane. And so Todd Whitaker says, and for any teacher who's listening out there, you never want to get on a plane where the pilot learned to fly from worksheets. So the next time your child comes home to look for sheets. Oh, may I have a motion for adjournment? <laughs> Second. Fletcher Hernandez, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same. We are. Thank you all.